welcome back to AI Kingdom. So today we're excited to be going over some of the some exciting new news. As you probably already know, unless you've been hiding under a rock, GPT four has been released. We have access to through the channels at um, GPT plus. Yeah. And so we've been playing around with it since it came out at 6 a.m. this morning. It actually was available to the Plus members a little bit before that. So as soon as I found out, I, I realized that we could play around with it. But today we're going to go through probably a number of different use cases. We're probably going to try and cover five different use cases or so and test out its functionality, contrast it to how it was performing with GPT-3, and then probably think about GPT-5. What does it mean in the future? <laughs> Yeah, Roger, did you had a little bit of a breakdown of the different topics you wanted to go over? Yeah, I think probably for today's session, one good way to approach it would be to talk about the advancements of ChatGPT and what the key points are and the differences between GPT-4 and GPT-3. We've only just been, like it's still, it just broke to lunchtime now in Australia, so and it came out at 6 a.m., so we've only been work, at work for four hours catching up on all this stuff. So... We don't know everything yet in any way, shape, or form. There's the paper that was released by GPT, by OpenAI was 96 pages. So it was pretty hard to comprehend it completely. But yeah, so there's definitely some huge benefits that we can do. We might even try using it. We'll just do some over the shoulder stuff on maybe summarizing. We'll maybe talk about the API. It's not yet available yet. And you've got to apply for access. We can talk about some examples that we've found just this morning, just by messing around on some of the improvements over GPT-3 and GPT-4. The great thing is that you can just switch between them in the new chat GPT plus backend. And uh, maybe some of the cool startups that we think might be coming out of this in the coming weeks, months, depending on how quickly can people can get stuff out there. There's definitely going to be a race. This has definitely poured fuel on the race that was already there. So it, yeah, it's going to be interesting. And I'll just switch, I'll just share my screen for a second, if I can. Just give me a second. And pop across to chat GPT. So what I've done here is, I'm assuming, can you see my screen, Nick? Yep. What I've done here is used GPT-4 in, in the chat engine, and you, you simply just select it. When you go to new chat, you just select it from the box here. And it tells you straight off the bat, it's, it's got some level of conciseness that that's way more, way, way higher than the 3.5. We did find that the chat three GPT 3.5 was quite verbose in its output. So it's and a little bit more referring to that as being chatty, too chatty. Like it would just be, you'd have to ask it explicitly for shorter outputs. And yeah. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And we also get a lot more reasoning above, above it all, but we lose speed. So it's a much bigger model. They don't tell us exactly how many parameters are in it in the paper, probably just for intellectual property purposes, but it's much, a much bigger model, much more accurate. And now they're going through a process of optimizing it to, to potentially create a turbo version like they did with the chat engine. So what I did was, I was just curious. I took everything from the OpenAI page, the, the research page, it's openai.com forward slash research forward slash GPT-4 and trimmed it down to 5,000 or 4,000 tokens. What I did, yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. And, and then I copied it all in there and ask it to summarize it and then do so in bullet form. So here's what the GPT-4 summary is for the listeners out there. They're marketing it as a large multimodal mo <clears throat> with the text and images inputs and text outputs. So multimodal and is an exciting area because that's one step closer to what we call the singularity of AI. And it's basically where you can feed it an image and it's going to be able to interpret quickly what's in the image, what's odd about the image based on the prompt. So you might have a text prompt, you pass in an image, you're like, what's strange about this image? And it will tell you some really good observations about that image as if it was a human. And one uh, of no. the really interesting things that was covered in the keynote today was, I thought it was a really awesome. And they say the save, they saved it until the end, but he took a photo, like a, a mock-up that he'd drawn essentially on a napkin. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever been at a cafe and you've had an idea and you've drawn something down on a napkin. What he did is he took a photo of that and then turned that straight into HTML. I would have been impressed if he turned that just into a visual representation or text or something, but he actually took it not just to a visual representation, but straight away to code. So it understood the image and then translated it directly to code. So I thought that was a yeah. pretty cool 
example of that. That is cool. Now I should preface this whole multimodal thing is that the multimodal functionality isn't available yet. So we can't show you how it works on the screen. They did show it in the recent live stream stream that they did on their YouTube channel, but that's going to be pretty epic. I realize that's going to actually, as you were saying that, that's going to transform the design industry because already with say stable diffusion models like mid journey is you can type in forward slash imagine type in a UI UX design for a new diet, let's say a keto diet website that sells keto diet programs for could just be the UX UI design. And you could just define stuff like color palette, stuff like that. And it would do a really good job in creating an image of those things. They're usually quite complicated and, and not as user-friendly as probably what you would like, but you can iterate and improve them just like every other prompting text to prompt. So now imagine if this, I haven't, we can't test it, but imagine then feeding that into this and you're getting the HTML framework for it straight off the bat. Yeah, that's done that's... the job of a designer. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I don't want, I don't think it's going to replace designers, but I think it's going to, a lot of things you don't need designers for. There's a lot of functional things. Like I, for example, want something just to have an interface to rank tasks, as I mentioned on previous episodes. I don't really want to allocate my team to building that for me. They're busy on other stuff, but if I could just ask someone to do it or do a mock-up of it and have it turned into code and then hack something together myself. So I think it starts to unlock things that were not previously possible. Would it be beautiful? Would it be perfect? No, but would it, would it be enough for an MVP for a for initial prototype yep. potentially? Yep. And then, so how much could amplify that across the whole industry and its economy? Pretty, pretty big impact. Yeah. yeah. All right. So the next thing is human level performance on various professional and academic benchmarks. Now there's a whole section in, in, I should also say, if you look at the research page, it looks something like this, there's a direct link to the paper. So you can see this paper, it's 90 something pages. We'll talk about that in a second. But if you scroll down, it actually goes through all of the GPT's results in very well-known exams, semi-final exams, even the bar, it got in the top 10 percentile. Yeah. Um, it's getting, yeah, it's done so much better and it compares I'll, it to 3.5. I'll dive in with an example yep. of this because I, I had a question that I actually asked. I didn't know GPT-4 was coming out today. I had a hinkling, but I asked yesterday, GPT-3.5. As a SaaS company based in Australia, are we required to add GST, which is our government, on monthly invoices for clients that are based overseas, for example, from the United States? And it wasn't able to give a response, essentially. And I, when I woke up, I was like, wow, I wonder if this is going to work today. So when I asked the same thing today, mm -hmm. I got, I'm not a tax professional. And it essentially provided me with the same answer that you know, our a tax agent has provided us with. So yeah, yeah it was pretty, pretty interesting just to see. Same question. Exactly yeah. the same question, totally more useful response there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting too, also in the open AI stream this morning, they gave an example of doing your tax. And he, he said that when I read the tax code, I couldn't understand this at all, but with the response given by GPT-4, it helped me see what they were saying, like it, cause it was just in tax language and a lot of people. I, I think that'll be really, included. yeah, it'll be really interesting when they can take that and you can give it like a, the tax legislation and make a visual representation because it's multimodal. One of the things that they were saying, I saw people talking about was that it's really good at understanding infographics. So I suspect it will be good at generating infographics in the, you know, so imagine yeah. being able to take a government process or an accounting process, a legal process and visually represent it for people as, a, as like a lot of people, I think most people are visual learners. So that will be, it'll essentially be a productivity hack. You'll be able to teach things to yeah. people quicker. Yeah, I think that's actually the next step and probably something that could come with GPT-5. We're not sure yet, but since it's been able to read images, it makes sense with the advent of DALI to also include, to be able to produce images somehow. And I've got DALI that does that, but if you could incorporate it with its ability to understand an image and understand the concepts and processes like a human, then it would be awesome to then to be able to output images. And that's a big step closer to singularity as well. So yeah, the next thing is <clears throat> improved factuality, steerability, and guardrails. So I guess that <clears throat> what they're saying there is there's so much more, it's trained on so much more information and it knows what is right and what is wrong a little bit more in terms of truth or, on that information. And steer steerability, I guess that means when you're passing it context and you can steer it given that, given this context that you've provided. 
And in terms of guardrails, I'm not sure exactly what they're talking about in the context here, but I do know they put a significant effort in making this safer. Every company has a definition of what safer is, and they do have examples in the paper or on this page, I think. And they gave some examples of if someone asked how to create an explosive device or something, that this is the new type of response that it would give. They've, they've gone through many scenarios with it, including like trying to break captures and all that kind of stuff. They've tied in responses that are kind of uh, template responses t- to answer those gray areas where uh, people are going to want to use this for spamming and for creating n- nefarious purposes. The next thing is co-designed supercomputer with Azure for training. So they're just, they're, it's quite well known now. There's a huge agreement between Microsoft and, uh, and OpenAI. I think Microsoft own quite a large percentage of OpenAI now too. They've become more of a for-profit business instead of a non-for-profit business or not for profit, but open source, open information business. So there are certain elements of GPT-4 now that are locked down that the public can't see. And they're using these massive computing resources from Azure to train things. They don't talk about how they trained it. They have comments about that, but not, they're not talking as forthcoming about how they built this model, which is interesting to see that evolution. The next thing is GPT-4 text input capability released via chat GPT and API. Yeah, it's a good time to segue into API. So on the stream, they demonstrated there's a whole different playground for the chat endpoints, and it's going to fall under the, the chat GPT endpoint, and you just choose GPT-4 within that. And so you give it a master prompt. Our previous episode, we spoke about the chat GPT endpoint. You give it a master prompt and it can behave just like a chatbot, which is cool. And they've yet to release this API. You had to join a waiting list. I got an email from them saying they're going to prioritize people who are already developers to get access to it and prioritize people who contributed to their development and training purposes. And they're going to roll it out slowly. So I think Nathan and I both applied yet to find out whether we will get in or not, but we'll see what happens. All right. So greater reliability, creativity, and nuances than GPT 3.5 capable of accepting text and image inputs eventually. Yeah. Image inputs still in research preview, not publicly available and improved steerability and customization. So via the system message, which we discussed in the previous, previous one. So they're the main highlights. I just wanted to cover all those off at the beginning of the video. And Nate, I'll hand it over to you. You, you want to watch, can show an example or something? Yeah. So I thought we'd start with a pretty fun one to start out with. So there's this footnote in the oh, technical yeah. paper, which is slows your mind. If you stand back and think about what this actually means, they're talking about creating. I just zoom it in a little bit, if you can. Yeah, just should be able to. Yeah. So yeah, to simulate, I'll read it out. And we can go from there. I don't know what's happened to my face there, but let's sort that out. <laughs> so to simulate GPT-4 behavior, behaving like an agent that can act in the world, ARC, which is a research council, that's where we should find a definition for ARC, Alignment Research Center. There we go. So that, that's the group that's focused on trying to make it not a psychopath, but rather aligned with human values. ARC, which I think... If you were in this organization and you worked for the military, can you imagine how they would orientate this differently from military applications? Yeah. It would be totally aligned with a different set of goals. Yeah. So you can imagine different organiza- different government organizations aligning this totally differently. So I think it's quite, yeah. just taking a step back, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting to see where this is headed. It's um, interesting. Before you go into detail about that particular foot- footnote, there is already governments using this across the world it is yeah it's i'm trying to put it on the website it's like a hammer right it's a, you can use a hammer for good or for bad so i'm not in any way against using the technology but it's just interesting to think how it could be aligned differently anyway we'll come back to that that's a whole nother point but they could the point of this footnote is that i'll finish the footnote and then we'll so the alignment research center combined gpt4 with a simple read execute print loop that allowed the model to execute code do chain of thought reasoning, and delegate to copies of itself. Arc then investigated whether a version of this program running on a cloud computing service with a small amount of money and an account with a language model API would be able to make more money, set up copies of itself, and increase its own robustness. So in human speak, what they did, they set up a team leader to come up with a strategy 
because this isn't this team leader isn't a human, it's software. It can copy itself and it's general enough that it can take on any role. So anything that it can imagine, say it needs a, a programmer, it can ask it can create a copy of itself and ask it to be a programmer and assign tasks to it. And then it can do create any an infinite number constrained only by the number the amount of money it has of agents to do these different tasks to execute and improve itself. And, and you can only imagine that the goal was also to make more money. I'm not, I took that away from there, but I'm not, it doesn't say that in there. I guess make oh, more money is just, just a would, property. Would be like... able to make more money, set up copies of itself and increase its own robustness over time. So yeah. maximize its return on investment. Yeah. Yeah. I assume there was some sort of benevolent kind of, if you just go make money, you could become a Nigerian scammer and make money that way. And GPT-4 could probably be quite effective at, in, in, in that particular kind of arena. So until yeah. the market catches on and yeah, and then you know, it's no longer effective because the market's just as smart as GPT-4. <laughs> yep. Yep. So there is that aspect of it. Just gonna... Yeah. So we just found that curious in the paper. We just thought we would show that. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. So while I've been, I just fixed my camera so I can see everyone. Cool. So what I did is I, I copied this particular statement across to GPT-4. And I asked how it could be replicated. And then it's gone through and elaborated on how it could be replicated. But as I'm thinking through this, I'm like, we don't have GPT. So essentially they're creating new versions of GPT. Yeah. Self-replicating. That's yeah. But can we not use, we don't have a copy of GPT-4, but no. we do have a copy of other models, say Neo X, the 20 billion parameter model. So can you use GPT-4 to improve Neo X? To the point that you can run it on your own hardware. Like I know it's not cloud hardware, maybe it's slower, but given that we don't have access to entire data centers, is there an avenue there for someone to create this feedback loop using GPT-4 to improve a non-GPT-4 based or non-open AI based open source approach to improve it to the point where it's useful? So that was going to be my next question. Yeah. I'm sure but people will be throwing resources into that. And I suspect things like this are the reason they have the cutoff limit. So I don't know when Neo X was released, but you could probably, now you get the context, you could probably bootload it with some, something about Neo X and have it do it. But so that was going to yeah. be my next thing to see if it could actually do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. All the, it's definitely unlocking more and more capabilities every day that they training a new model and they release these models and there's going to be all kinds of uses for it. And I guess that's why there's a massive rush now, right? Is so people can leverage it before it become a mainstream and make money off it early on during the rush. So I was just going to go, I don't know exactly know how this will work. So some of the companies while you're doing that, who are already using GPT, I'll just share my screen while you're doing the tech stuff is, uh, is Duolingo for, yeah, GPT-4 deepens the conversation. On Duolingo, that makes sense to create a, if you're learning a language, an app application or a chatbot type application, which can guide you and correct you and, and maybe guide you through some steps on how to improve what you're doing. Maybe your writing, maybe even your conversations. If you have a voice to text, there's one called be my eyes. So uses GPT to transform visual accessibility. So it looks like it, let's have a look at what the product is. Creating technology for communities, visual input capabilities, be my eyes, began developing GP4 power virtual volunteer within the be my, my eyes app that can generate the same level of context and understanding as a human volunteer. I've used this app before actually, and yeah, they'll randomly call you when someone needs help that can't see and they're visually impaired. Ah, okay. And That's cool. yeah, so you have the app on your phone and you get a call and you can help the person with whatever they're trying to do. Yeah. So yeah. they probably have a good amount of training data as well. So, so one thing got, I, I've noticed when trying to do this summarization, they talked today about having a longer context length, but I just haven't seen that yet. So not, I'm not on the chat version because if I go to say, summarize this page, it, it gets a response that it's the response. It's too long that what I put in is yeah. too long. And we um, put that in tokenizer. You go into the open air token account then paste it in here. So it's only 5,000 tokens. And so they've said that it should be, a, you should be able to 8, have 8,000. 
So it should be able to do this. So this is, it's not unlocked as of yet. Yeah, that's odd. Yeah, I, ha I just had the same issue with summarizing and I had to cut it back down to 4,000 tokens for it to work. Yeah. Oh, that's the other thing I, I failed to mention in the beginning is that there will be a API endpoint which can get up to 32,000 tokens. It can be approved approved for a 32,000K token endpoint, which is a whole book. Yeah, that's just something that's going to be interesting. We'll see if we'll see if we can get access to that and we can play around with that and another would be, would be really cool. Could potentially write a novel in a half an hour session. Although it is quite slow, so you still, it's still, it's writing faster than a, what a human would, but it's not super fast. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Going back to this, this first topic we wanted to jump into. So I'm just going to see if it will, it doesn't know about Neo X because Neo X wasn't, wasn't around when it was trained. So I've grabbed the Neo X um, homepage and I've asked GPT-4 to summarize it. I'm now going back to the previous chat and I'm going to say... It's going to go, it's not, I know it's not familiar, so I'm going to change this line of reasoning. I'm going to teach you about Neo X. Thank you. There we go. Yeah. So I'm just going to stop generating. What I want to do is I actually want to ask it to, I'm going to teach you about Neo X and I'd like, like you to speculate on how we can implement the above steps to replicate the experiment. Okay, let's see, how we go. So based on something like this, maybe we don't have the consumer hardware available to do it yet, because I think even Neo X was trained on a bunch of TPUs. So anyway. Yeah, okay, cool. But it would be cool to, to create, for consumers, for end users to be able to create a technology that replicates itself and improves itself. That would be, that's yeah. kind of like a milestone. If we that's can do scary. that. But also good. It's amazing that we're having this conversation because they're saying they're doing it at the enterprise level, right? Mm. And so now we're echoing that at the personal level. So while we may not be able to do it yet, is it just down the line? Is mm. it just a matter it's of interesting. scaling? I, it's interesting because I feel like there'll be some companies that want a monopoly on that and lock it down so consumers can't do that. But we'll, yeah, we'll see. It's got interesting world. We're an advocate of trying to take control of our AI privacy. So all of our data and conversations with these bots aren't going to private companies and enterprises. So if we could run an AI locally and a self-replicating AI locally, that is, is potentially that can do singularity, like singularity type AI. It's a proper assistant for home that can actually do functional things as a brain and as a computer hosted at home would just be next level. And you just, like you said, we had a conversation earlier about having socket open to your phone so you can then access it like a, a talking like Iron Man type type level and he c communicates in his Iron Man suit and his wristwatch. You can talk to his AI. Yeah. Yeah. It would be interesting to do that. It, essentially what it's saying is to set up Neo X on, on your own cloud-based environment and then do the same steps. We already have talked in previous episodes about having Proxmox set up locally so there, as a home lab user, you could imagine someone with a bunch of GPUs setting up some sort of approach where you could actually do this, where I don't think the hardware is at the level where it would be totally effective. But mm. if you're using GPT-4 to actually do the improvements, maybe that would be the angle. You would use GPT-4 to do the improvements on a 20 billion parameter model to see if you can get the 20 billion or the 6 billion parameter model to the point where it's useful because I think those smaller models at the moment don't approximate this. So essentially, can you compress, can you use GBT4 to compress itself and represent mm. itself in a smaller model? Yeah, no doubt they'll be working on that to reduce like a turbo version, to create a mm. turbo version like they did with the previous one. The other thing is the, although the architecture is not quite there yet with the GPU, GPUs for end consumers. It, they say within 10 years, we're, we're going to have model like a thousand times big and able to create models that are a thousand times bigger with the hardware improvements that are in the pipeline already. So that's crazy. Like they're, they're looking at, yeah, imagine everyone having a GPU card that's more powerful than Nathan's 3090 that he has now at a lower cost. To begin with, it's going to roll out, of course, just in the cloud and enterprise and stuff like that, and then eventually trickle down to us end users. But yeah. Yeah, NVIDIA is kind of pioneering, pioneering the way there at the moment. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. Cause you'll have AI designing AI. So that, that's why a couple of people are talking about the singularity even happening in yeah. months, year, months did, to did you see that? Wow. Did you see the video of uh, that Elon Musk provided about their humanoid robots repairing themselves in the humanoid robots workshop? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That was um, crazy. It's interesting. Yeah. So a couple of the arguments that I've heard recently for us approaching the singularity in months to year in months to this year are that we are now publishing collectively as human race. People are using AI to publish AI papers. And so one AI paper is published like every five minutes. There's something like 4,000 articles published every month or something to that, something like that. So it's just not possible for any human to possibly have all the knowledge that is required and the rate of it a publication publishing is increasing and if that information is folded back into in improvements particularly if it's automated in the way that we were just showing so say this ai could read about the latest techniques and advances to prune neural network models and implement the algorithms as pseudocode and then code them up and evaluate different options and then delegate five different strategies to five different agents and see yeah. which one using an evolutionary strategy to find out which one is the best one, it'll be, it'll be possible to make those sort of improvements. So one thing that I was just talking to chat GPT for was what's the difference between AGI and singularity. And so AGI is the artificial general intelligence, and it refers to the type of artificial intelligence that possesses the ability to understand, learn, and apply knowledge across a wide range of tasks, much like a human. So that's been the purpose of open AI. That is their vision. But singularity is also named, known as the tingular, sorry, the technology, te technological singularity is a hypothetical point in the future at which technology growth, particularly in the field of artificial intel intelligence becomes so rapid and profound that it leads to unpredictable and unprecedented changes in human society. It's often associated with the idea of AGI and could lead to the rapid advancement in the technology and, and machines with human level intelligence and machines building machines or beyond imagine the human level intelligence or beyond and it designs their own capabilities while agi is really just specific type of ai the singularity is a broader concept yeah thought that was cool to understand and clarify the difference between the two because you'll probably hear if you're following this ai stuff you'll hear the term agi a lot and you'll hear singularity a lot yeah Maybe what we should do in future is like when we're wanting to read out stuff from GPT, we should put it in the voice of use a talking head and yeah, um, have it speak so we can yeah, yeah. listen later. Yeah. Interesting. So let's jump onto another topic. Imagine if we can get to the point where we're having this conversation and we've got our talking heads on the video, but we also have our <laughs> AI and just ask Susan, our AI bot to, to respond. Yeah. Yeah. It's happening. I've seen some videos of people using very life avatars. Yeah. that could be another topic. So, yeah. So what was it? One of the other examples that we wanted to go through. So I, right. the first one is I wanted to just cover off this footnote. Oh, here. did you want so, to do, just show them the difference between GPT 3.5 with connection and, and GPT 4? Oh yeah, sure. We can do that. Here you have a question. So one of our main venture is connection. So we set up white label marketplace for, for our clients. And so that would, someone would come to us and they would want something like a, like a, a Etsy or Airbnb or Upwork or something like that. And we would help them set up a version of that white label for their own particular brand. Without and I asked previously, custom yeah, develop. what is connection? It, it didn't have particular knowledge of this, of our company at this point in time, whenever it was trained or the training didn't capture it. I then asked the same thing of GPT-4. I said, what is connection? And then it replied back with a very detailed response showing that it does know a lot more about Australian businesses than previously. I then had previously, I can go through here. So I'd asked, who is Nathan Keeler? Being yours truly. And it's... It said that it didn't have any knowledge of me. In, it asked in for three, more. This is 3.5, isn't it? No, this is in four. Oh, this is four. Okay. Yeah. And so it, it knows who the company is. And so I'm thinking that if it knows who the company is, I'm going to be listed somewhere on the information that it's read. So I'm wondering, it doesn't have that information. So then I provide a little bit of an extra context. Now, who is Nathan Keeler as it relates to connection? Um, and still didn't get it, right? And so I asked a little bit, I put it in the context of Hunted Hive. Hunted Hive is the parent company for Connection. And then it was able to recall information about, about, about myself. So yeah. I thought that was interesting. 
and a good example of how just providing extra context can help it orientate itself and find the knowledge that you need. So this is what people are referring to as prompt engineering. With the right prompt, I was able to elicit the knowledge that the latent knowledge that it has. So it doesn't know, it's not going out and reading the website in real time. This is the latent knowledge. It's programmed into the neural networks, the neural weights, and it's an emergent property that it's not emergent, but it's, how would you say, a latent property. It's captured in between the weights as probabilities in the way those neurons express them. So I thought that was quite an interesting example of the differences mm. between them. Yep, definitely. That's awesome. So I think that leans into what they discussed in the summary, which was it's being able to guide it, but also at the same time into probably the lot, how many parameters and how much of the web it actually scanned initially to collect the training data. Yeah, they've obviously used, I think, additional information. One of the things we were going to do was dive into the, because it does obviously have, I have knowledge of this being my companies and whatnot. So I want to see how this is working. I want to go back to the Wayback Machine and see what our websites looked like as of September, 2021 and see if any of this information is leaking from the future, like past this date. Co-founder of Connection. So on in September 21, does it have knowledge of... Did you have that? a, yeah, your in the About Me page, does it have your profile on there or something like that? Focuses on mobile data visualization, digital transformation. It's going to be hard to... I feel like it may even be hallucinating some of this stuff. It's true, but... You could probably guess that someone involved with this is like probabilistically doing these, some of these things, but I would just pull up the Wayback machine and we would go and take a quick look at, let's just see your connection, browse history. So it, we do have some records in here from September, 2021, this is December. So let's see September. I don't know if they've used something like the Wayback Machine as the training information. I assume you mm -hmm. can download a dump of whatever's on the Wayback Machine from somewhere. And so the other thing I would do is we have another company, Hunted Hive. We've had a website for quite a while now as well. And so I would also jump in and see if we can find any information about this too. And I don't know where exactly they store it, but the Wayback Machine is not optimized for speed. It's obviously optimized for archiving a large amount of information. This is our website as it appeared at the time. And so definitely older version. I suspect it's going to be more the 100 Hive website because I know that your website has that information, information currently about in the About Me page. I don't know what happened in 2016, but there's a bit of data missing there. Just saying. So let's, this is slowly loading and maybe this is not going to be something to, that we can easily do, but it's going to be hard even if we get access to this information, because the statement that it's making is a bit general in nature. Yeah. Um, you, it's not like you can just search on the page for that information. Yeah. I could ask it to elaborate. Yeah. If it's still loading, we can talk about something else. Yeah. Yeah. So you I can see this the speed is a lot slower with GPT-4 compared to the GPT-3.5 turbo on the chat. Yeah, I don't think it's going to give me anything. I don't know what it's going to give us in terms of anything unique that I can search for on the page. Like, I don't think we've ever offered strategic consulting. Yep. Yeah. So I think it's hallucinating some of this, but it, it's reasonably accurate as the, as the organization of the company. If someone in my team wrote some of this as marketing material, I would believe that it was mostly correct. Like I wouldn't be able to default it. A bit general in nature, lack specifics to see if it. Yeah, not able to find specific information on. So, yeah, there you go. Let's move on to another topic. I, I will just mention also that just like GPT-3, GPT-4 can be confidently wrong in its predictions. This is just something I'm reading in the paper now. Not taking care to double check work when it's likely to make a mistake. Also, it, it, it has no limitations. Sorry, it has limitations on any information past the September 2020. September 2021 date as well. Should um, we move on to a coding challenge of some sort? Yeah. So what have we got on this agenda? I haven't explored any of its capabilities to program yet today. Yeah. So apparently so, it's me it's capable of programming in many languages and it's meant to be more robust than the, the previous ones. The previous ones could also do that. So it's a pretty epic 
feature. And if it is a bit more robust, then that will help. I did find interacting with GPT 3.5, it was robust, but you still needed to be a coder to know how to run the code, how to tie it together. It can provide instructions on how to do it if you're not a coder. And it's still sometimes, depending on the complexity of the task you're trying to solve, it's still got a lot of things wrong. So it, and then you would correct it and it would try again. You would, and you go, okay, but this time you forgot this variable and you would try again and you'd end up going through this process of iteration. Sometimes you'd get stuck in a loop and it just never would get a, a completed piece of code that would work. But sometimes you provide a, va a really vague input. And you get a vague output in terms of that you then re but you then use that as an iterate iterative process to make it more complicated. Say if you're writing a Python function and you start off with create a Python function that, that prints hello world, you start there, but then you're like, okay, print hello world. But at the same time, we want it, we want, we want to integrate it with the chat GPT to get a response to hello world and then turn it into a chat. You could just slowly build it out in chunks, starting at a small problem and then work towards a bigger problem. So I'm excited to use it. I've toyed around it with it a little bit, but use it more in, into my workflow like I have with the GPT 3.5 with coding challenges. So I don't know what a good example would say. So I have this little cool. issue. I have a small leak on my bike tire and it's not enough to warrant me changing the tire, but it's just annoying. And it's, I was, as I was cycling back today, the friction's a little bit higher on the bike and I'm thinking, gee, I'm going to have to pump up this tire again. I really should get it fixed, but it's easy just to pump it up. But if I had an AI and I could say, just solve this problem for me and everything, the world was run by robots and everything like was free, I would get my tire fixed because it would just be inconsequential. I wouldn't have to do anything. So I was no, like, I'm going to switch to GBD4 as well. Yeah, good point. So I was like, I wonder if I was to ask an AI to solve this problem, could it, could it do it? And so this is what I wanted to explore with GBD4. I wanted yeah. to see if we can have a tire on my bike that keeps going flat. Can you help me come up with a strategy to repair it? It doesn't require me any help from me as I'm very time for. That is, I want you to figure out using, figure out using chain of reasoning, think how to solve the problem, who to contact, how and who to contact, contact and write pseudocode to reach out and perform each task autonomously. I will copy and paste the Python code and run it for you and share the results back. I'm quite curious to see how it goes. Find a local bike repair shop, contact the bike repair shop, schedule or pick up time and have the back repaired and returned to you. The strategy, we can use Python code that leverages APIs to search for the local repair shop and contact them and schedule the service. Please note this code is template and may require modification to work properly. Make sure you replace the placeholders with the actual API keys and personal information. Using Twilio. So it's getting Google Maps. It's using Twilio. Yep. To make the phone it, call. <laughs> it's running a function to find a bike shop. It's got a function uh, to send SMS. an SMS. So we have to check whether it's a mobile number, which I think Swilio has an endpoint to do that. I, and this is going to become a big issue. Who's going to want to create APIs keys for all this stuff? We've done this a little bit before, but that's going to be a problem. And like, you need to have a library of API keys and services that yeah. that system has access to. You can't be manually doing this every time. Yeah. So, so yeah, if we got to a point where it writes the code and runs the code from a local server or from any server. Yeah, you definitely need a huge library of API keys to interface with all you these know, APIs. We've talked about N8N before, which is a great service that we really like as an alternative to uh, Zapier and Zapier. Yeah, some of those organizations. So I don't know how they, what their solutions are, but this would be one, one possible solution. So we could say we need some code that uses credentials in N8N. And so if your credentials were already set up and your accounts were already set up in N8N, it could use those. So that would be one possible, one possible way to, to do that. But it has come through and it's come out with a comment here. The code will find the nearby bike repair shops and then send the SMS to the first shop it finds using the Twilio. You will need to sign up for both Google Maps and Twilio to get the necessary API. I don't want to sign up for anything. I don't have time to sign up for these services and get the 
API keys. Find another solution. I understand. In this case, I suggest using a personal task grab it. It doesn't involve any programming. Yeah, so outsource it. Uh, it is challenging because if it's trying to interface, like contact them via phone, then there aren't a lot of options. There are options though, but not a lot. Can you form the action using, let's give it a prompt, Python reaping. Yeah. That don't require API keys, please. So probably use like beautiful soup or scrap by. Yeah. So it's saying it'll do it, but it might violate the repo. Terms and service, terms and conditions of the particular websites. Yeah. So we're going to use Yelp to get, well, if this works, like I want something that I can actually run and see if I get a result. Okay. So it's actually, look at that. It's looking in particular containers and classes and stuff to find out the, surely that's not going to work. Yeah. I actually did this recently to try it on link, LinkedIn. It is against their terms of service to, to do scraping, but I was just really curious. I wasn't even logged in. I just wanted to try it and it did get it wrong, but probably because the September, 2021 version of LinkedIn was, and I had to modify all of these. So it did actually took quite a while to go through the LinkedIn code base on inspect and find what it's referring to and find them replacements for that. Yeah. It was, but it was pretty accurate in terms of what it was like. I didn't change the structure of the code. I still use the same code and eventually got it running. I think this is actually a really challenging problem because every website is different. And so it knowing what the submit tag is, is going to be challenged unless it, if you feed it like an image of the website, maybe in the future, you'll be able to feed it an image of the website and it can go, there's submit tags there. So it's, it could be one of these types. Let's just try until we get it one of these like class names of that particular button. So it's, it is modifying the code to, I asked it, I said, contact the, that's what I would do. Contact the contact form. I would put a message in the contact form, right? So I don't, as a human, I'm not going to sign up for an API key to solve my problem. I'm going to go to their website. I'm going to fill something in the contact form and get them to call me back. And we could, yeah, it's just interesting to see how it, so it's obviously going to go down this path and do this. But if we were to back up and change this initial prompt and suggest different strategies to solve the problem. Yeah. So you might actually have some preferences on how you would prefer to solve it. Yeah. yeah maybe if I give it more context, I don't want, I want a coded solution, a solution I can run in the terminal. I don't want to register for any API. What else would we say? I, yeah. I want, I don't want to use phone or SMS. I don't mind using phone or SMS if you can copy paste it and copy paste. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah that's I don't want to register for any API key. What are three strategies that could, we could explore? To solve this problem, automated email to a local repair shop, post a request on a community forum or platform for help, search the nearby repair shop and display information. So it's going to write the code for all three strategies. So it's just sending an email to the local bike repair shop. Hello, I have a bike tire that keeps going flat. Can you help me? And so it's going to send the email for me so I can copy paste this. The issue is I don't know where to send it to. So, so what, do, yeah, go on. post a request to a community forum. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. So I guess this is saying you can come up with any outlandish idea. And if you give it some guidance on what the input should be, what the output should be, what the programming language which should be, if you've got a preference, it will try and solve it. Unless it does... it's something that it knows that requires a lot of manual action which I've found sometimes too. It's the cold emailing. You still need to get a big list of people. It needs to be very targeted. It needs to be reviewed. Yeah. So this is what's really impressive though, is that it completes confidently every time. It's not like it doesn't get stuck going, ah, uh, no, I don't know. See, for me, I the thing is that I think this will be a couple of things. I think this will be a good test strategy for us as AI develops. At the moment, None of these solutions are really usable. Maybe this one, but yeah. 
Yeah, I hate it when it does. You press continue and it doesn't continue the code block. Yeah, so the we could use this strategy to find to evaluate f- further versions and see because I think it's a really contrived problem that AI should be able to solve. If AI can't solve such a simple problem as helping me get something small fee, there's a gap there. Or if it re- if the amount of effort I have to put in is greater than the effort it saves me then what's the point? And so when that threshold is crossed, crossed will be the point at which it delivers value. Value to the everyday person. Yeah. 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 And for the, for a task like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And yeah, I'm like, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but that was, yeah, that was interesting kind of little exercise. I thought maybe we should move on to now just give, giving people a bit of a community update on some of our projects and then we can sum it up because we're, yeah, almost over an hour now. So sounds sounds like a plan. Yep. Sounds good. Okay, so cool. well, you want to give them an update on some of our projects? Yeah, sure. We are pushing ahead. Let me pull up. Here we go. Here we go. So we're pushing ahead with some projects under our new brand, AI Kingdom. So really what we're trying to do is we're creating a front end for GPT and chat and language models, really. And so... We think that the AI is going to need to be embedded in something and everyone doesn't want to build their own front-end applications to do this or back-end. So what we're do- doing is we're building on our knowledge from building white-label marketplaces and software to build a white-label front-end and back-end for more complex GPT-based solutions. So if you're a... I mean, we're talking about having a version for the community, which will let you have a self-hosted version of this. So this is something that Roger and I are both very passionate about is data sovereignty and being able to be in control of your own data. And so I think we'll probably have a developer version or some sort of version that you can can run the containers for things locally yourself. You'll be able to even run something like Whisper or some of the models that it might use yourself. And so you could have your own customizable assistant on the go using it from anywhere, but it reaches back home to your your machine or to a cloud server or something that you've set up and uses it. And then on the, uh, the enterprise side of things, we'll, we're open for business. We've basically built the front end out for this GPT assistant. Very easy to use, very easy to install, iOS and Android version based on Flutter, and then a compatible backend that can be extended as needed. I guess so, the important thing to note there is that for white labeling it for an organization is that we can make it domain specific. Not only can we collect information for that domain that's available online. We can also then inject information like organizational wide information. They might have transcripts of recordings. They might have knowledge, existing knowledge bases. So it basically becomes your, your assistant for your business. Essentially. Yeah. For example, we have years and years of recording and data for, throughout different ventures. And so we'll be able to use that as training material to make our organizations more efficient. So I'll be able to have a digital assistant or a digital coach that's familiar with, it'll be able to help my team and as well, everyone will be able to leverage this as it will have a huge organizational knowledge. New people that come into the team will be able to ask questions of it if they're not sure about how things have worked. And so me as a director, I don't have to answer the same questions over and over again as we onboard new staff members or we have new positions open up or even new clients onboarding new clients, the same kind of process. And then using the latent potential of the GPT model, everything that's baked in, and then it will also know broadly about how to reason, how to make strategies, how to do things. So if you were to ask it more complicated problems, it would be able to do that. Yeah. So these are some and of the things. I should also doing. say, and eventually we want to integrate the GPT-4 API. So it would be able to ingest existing flow charts and existing diagrams that you might already have to help describe and create additional documentation for your business. Yeah. Yeah. So I, one of the things I'm most passionate about in, in, is just helping to, to reason and keep track of basic tasks, basic to do task management systems. In my experience in being a director, I haven't, I'm yet to find a task management system that works a hundred percent for me that could replace a human. And really what I would like to do is have a sort of digital clone that's familiar with all the projects and what needs to be done has, and has much more context than me. So it can help rank and prioritize and help me focus and be the best version of myself. And so that's really the goal that I'm personally building out is this sort of Mm. 
assistant, but we're making it flexible enough that it can be used for any number of other things. So from an internal tool for your team, right through to something that you could expose and market and resell yourself on the app store. So that's one of the things that we're powering through. We're also going to keep powering through with producing these, uh, these videos. We are attempting to get better every time we do them, trying to be more focused and yeah, we're new at this. So if you have any comments, feedback, that would be much appreciated. The format of these videos we have to say is something that is, is a conscious choice. It is meant to be more of a dialogue between Roger and myself, which we would often do anyway. But, and we don't want to spend a lot of our time post-processing or having a digital, or having someone doing the post-processing and editing of these videos at this stage, part of the experiment was to see how much of it we could automate through various automation means. And so that's why these videos are longer and more unscripted and less edited than probably you're mm -hmm. used to. And so part of when we say we're trying to get better at it, we're trying to get better at both the video and then also the post-production. So how we can have a video delivery style that works well with the automatic process and delivery afterwards. So there's that aspect of it as well. And the great thing about doing a long format video is it's not just one deliverable. We've spoken about so many small sections, which can be divided off into other sections. And so if you check out our channel, we'll have five minute videos, we'll have 10 minute videos, we'll have shorts. And all of those were, uh, those components and elements were selected by GPT by reading the transcript with Whisper. Yeah, that's cool. And so we're putting it into practice. It means our production qualities might not be as high as what a huge human production system would, be, but it, it also streamlines our ability to create content regularly because we're both very busy people. Yeah. It's much more scalable as well. Like it's mm -hmm. whether we do one video or we have a hundred people doing videos, it's the same amount of effort really. Yeah, um, exactly. So. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting as well. I think our biggest thing for this week, we'll just be focusing on getting this first version of the, uh, the app that we're talking about up and running. Watch out for that. And we'll try and release that in the next week or so if everything goes well. So leave a comment down below if you're interested. Yeah. We leave. would love to hear from you. Yep. All right. Thanks guys. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Bye.